The Biden administration has a new goal of inoculating nearly all Americans against COVID-19 by the end of summer. To that end, last week, the U.S. ordered an additional 200 million vaccine doses. This month marks the anniversary of COVID in America. Last year, on January 31st, there were eight confirmed cases. Now it's 26 million. A year ago, there were no reported deaths. But today, nearly 450,000 Americans are gone. As vast as these numbers are, there is a third, even larger group of pandemic sufferers. They are the bereaved, the family members left behind. They did not die, but they lost their lives, the lives they had so carefully planned. The story will continue in a moment. Tim Branscombe opened a tiny box and released a cheer. On a cruise in September 2019, Lauren Thomas collapsed into his arms, in part because he actually did get the ring she sent him in a picture. And I sent him screenshots just messing with him, like, you know, if you ever want to propose, I'm like, these are rings that I like. How did you meet? We actually met in high school. He was always looking for me, and I was always running the other way. Later on, we reconnected on Facebook, and I realized, like, oh, okay, you know. Tim, a 32-year-old security guard, and Lauren, a Chicago health insurance administrator, set their date, December 2021. I called him Teddy because he was just like a big teddy bear. He called me Kitty. He was a big guy, 6'7", like 417 pounds. On the surface, it's like, wow, oh, that's a big scary guy. But then when you got to know him, like, oh, you're just so cuddly. <laughs> but last April, when doctors were struggling to understand treatment, the big man fell hard after six days in the hospital. I got a call and it was a doctor and I just heard like all these like machines going off, like all these beeps. And she was asking me to have his mom call because it was an emergency. Tim's kidneys were failing. But then a few minutes later, like, the doctor called back. And when she called that time, it was quiet. The machines had stopped. The beeping had stopped. You could tell the room was quiet. So I knew, like, it was real. He was gone. Two weeks before, she picked flowers for the wedding. Now she was choosing funeral wreaths. I had to contact our wedding venue and let them know, like, hey, he passed away. There won't be a wedding. And I had to get that deposit back from them and then in turn contribute that money to his burial. Tell me about Tim's funeral. I don't even refer to it as a funeral because he couldn't even have, like, a proper decent funeral. It was just a viewing. Because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And that's like what hurts me the most because he was so personable, he was so charitable, he was so warm, and yet he had to die alone on a ventilator and couldn't even get a proper celebration of his life. With cruel isolation and outrageous speed, COVID has become the nation's third leading killer. Cancer and heart disease kill more, but they don't attack entire families at once. In March, Andy Phillips, a Pennsylvania sales executive, went into the hospital as his wife, Trish, and their four children suffered at home. Body aches, migraines, every vomiting, everything. Um, and then two days after my dad went in, I went into the hospital. Trish, you had Andy and Colin in the hospital at the same time. And you must have thought you could have lost them both. Yeah, and my father-in-law was in the hospital, too. Andy's father? Andy's father passed away from COVID on um, April 28th. And then Andy passed? May 31st. Andy Phillips was a six-day-a-week runner. Andy passed away at what age? He turned 53 the week before. He endured the marathon in the hospital for 65 days. Weeks later, Trish received a hefty envelope in the mail. It was addressed to Andy. It was an itemized um, bill from the hospital um, for about a, about four weeks of his hospital stay. What did it come to? 
it came to a little over $4 million. It was months before she learned that insurance would pay. It was unsettling at the worst time, but her husband's memory helped her through it. Andy's battle really touched and changed a lot of people. Um, and I think he'll continue to, to help us. How has it changed you? I'm definitely stronger than I thought. But, um, you know, I kind of always leaned on him. He was kind of our rock. It's just a different, different future for me. A different future and an uncertain one for the bereaved, including Jamie Dresick. We don't have the center of our universe anymore. We wanted to grow old with the grandkids and we had plans and those are all gone. In June, Jamie lost her 49-year-old husband, Craig. He was a college administrator in Connecticut. At some point, inevitably, you have to begin worrying about practical things. And Craig was the biggest part of your income. You know, we had life insurance, but 80% of our income was lost. And you hate to look at it like, you know, you think about the emotional part, and then you have to think of the practical thing, like how am I now gonna raise five children in this life that we've built together? We asked the five to join us. Alex, Sydney, Colby, Caden, and Kylie. My youngest is only 12 years old. I have a long way to go still. I can hear them, don't ask mom for that. That's too expensive. That makes me feel even worse because I don't want them to, it's hard enough dealing with losing your father. It's a lot to deal with having such a large family. On the other hand, many hands make light work. <laughs> yeah, as much work as they create, they help at the same time. <laughs> Not only the, the physical things that need to get done, but just to be able to share all of our different stories. And it's gonna help keep my husband alive and with us. Craig is sitting all around you. And when I look at them, I can see it. <laughs> I see the mannerisms, I see the behaviors, I see a little bit, a lot of him in each of them. Caden Dresick told us about his dad's last words to him. As of right now, you're the man in the house and you kind of like take over and uh, take all my responsibilities, so. There's a lot of, it's a lot, it's still a lot of pressure, but I feel like it's kind of my job to do. At the age of 15? Yeah. When a parent dies too young, children age too soon. COVID made Emmerich Falta an orphan. Me and my mom, um, we were best friends. She loved kids and she loved working with other people. After his father died years ago, his mother, his best friend, Emmy, raised him in New York. Last week, deaths in the city averaged 70 a day. But last spring, Emmy Falta was sick when 700 were dying each day. As a college junior, Emmerich eased her journey to the end. They told me that I was, uh, I was the person in charge of my mom uh, and her medical decisions. She was 41. Their last touch was through a screen. And throughout that entire FaceTime call, I tried to smile. I tried so hard to make, you know, if this was my last memory with her, I really wanted it to be me smiling. I wanted it to be me hopeful. And I said, Mom, you're going to make it through this, and um, I love you. How has losing your mother, your last remaining parent, changed your young life? I've always been independent. I've always been able to help out others when the help is needed. Now that I'm fully on my own, although it feels lonely, I I feel like I, I can manage. Jake Schofstall shares the loneliness and the need to manage. He told his dad there was no need to worry anymore about the family business. I said, Dad, I got it from here. Give me the torch and let me take care of Mom and Jaden and everybody. 
And I said, I'll keep the deer barn open no matter what. And how old are you now? I'm 17. The deer barn is a feed store in rural Indiana. Jake and his dad started it to add to John Schofstall's pay as a firefighter. When do you miss John the most? At night, when I remember he's not coming home. Jennifer Schofstall told us John got sick in March. Today, Indiana has vaccinated about 6% of the state, half a million people. But last spring, COVID seemed like just a curiosity on the news. We're Terre Haute, Indiana. We're not a big city. We're not world travelers. We're Midwest rural country folks, so I can't say that we really took it serious. She couldn't visit the hospital, so to be near him, she and others in the family sat in a car outside his room all day and all night, every day. I sent one text to one firefighter and said, eight o'clock tonight, I'll be at the hospital praying for John. And so that night, the entire fire department came. The vigil stood for more than a week. Lord, we, we lift John Shawstall up to you, and we thank you with everything we got. But 41-year-old John Shawstall died before dawn on a Sunday. Jennifer was with him on a FaceTime call. And they were doing CPR at that time, and I was um, telling him to stop. Don't go. I needed him. And then they said, we lost him. And that was Easter Sunday. He's one of the only people I have ever known to be able to go be in heaven on Resurrection Sunday. And that's pretty, pretty powerful to me. These are early days. Days when the bereaved still expect to hear the key in the door or catch themselves thinking about something they'll say when the one who's gone comes home. They are days that Lauren Thomas lives in the past tense. I can't help but notice you're wearing your engagement ring. Yes. I, I cannot take it off. Even though I saw him in the casket, I saw them lower that same casket into the ground. But taking this ring off just confirms that all of this is real. He is really gone, so I don't know how long it's going to be on my hand, but I'm in no rush to take it off. All over the country, people are talking about, isn't it going to be great when this is over? And it occurs to me, speaking to you, that for a lot of people in this country, it will never be over. Never be What is normal? Normal is not a thing for a lot of us anymore. 